But now I'd like us to turn to Chem Activity 27, where I'd like to discuss uh, pH theory. First of all, a cartoon. Let, let me help you if you, well, you can probably read it on your screen, but I, I like to read it out because I, I think it's nicely written here. You can see this uh, World War I kind of biplane. And it says, despite the heavy flak, McAllister's aim was true. And this carefully measured aliquot of hydrochloric acid found its mark deep in enemy, enemy's reservoir of sodium hydroxide. This is the best line. McAllister grinned wryly. Finally, one of the enemy's strongest bases had been completely neutralized. So, so as you know, we use that word neutralization. And one of the reasons why I highlight this cartoon is be careful with that word in the sense that for any titration, we often say, well, the base neutralized the acid, the acid neutralized the base. But the question is, is the pH at the equivalence point of the titration always neutral? Meaning, is it always such that the hydronium ion concentration equals the hydroxide concentration at 25 degrees Celsius? That would be pH seven. And the answer is no. And you need to know when it's not going to be neutral and when it will be neutral. And it's not hard to know, but you need to make sure you can do that. So let's take a look. Of course, in the lab, you did two of the prototypical kinds of titrations. And so I'm going to talk through both of those this morning, highlight some features. That, so starting off here, I've, I've tried to make a diagram so you can picture what's going on. So we've got our 0.1 molar NaOH in the burette. It's the titrant. The pH meter is in the analyte, the thing that's being analyzed. What we know about this scenario is we know what volume of strong acid we pipetted, just like in the lab and we know the concentration of NaOH. We monitor the pH over the course of the titration. We monitor it to see at what point do we have this drastic change in pH. That will help us make an estimation of the equivalence point. From there, we should be able to calculate the concentration of this hydrochloric acid and also divine other things. So you can see that the first part of this uh, set of key questions says, write the balanced equation for this titration reaction. Please omit any spectator ions. So who are the spectator ions here? Really good, yeah. So I just want to highlight that when we say 0.1 molar sodium uh, hydroxide, yes, you've got sodium ions, but we don't give a dickens about them. Something my grandfather would have said. No, I'm saying it. All right, so hydroxide ion is really the important thing there. And we know its concentration is 0.1 molar. And what about the hydrochloric acid? Well, when you put hydrochloric acid in water, you end up essentially with the hydronium ion. Yes, we got chloride ions, but once again, we don't give a dickens about the chloride ions. Those are the spectator ions. You also know that spectator ions, in this sense, are equivalent to negligible acids and bases. So the balanced equation for this is hydronium ion plus, <laughs> plus hydroxide ion will produce 2H2O. Would this equation apply to all strong acid, strong base titrations? For sure. Because all strong acids will have negligible conjugate bases. All strong bases will have negligible conjugate acids. So that's the only thing ever going on in this kind of titration. I'd like to point out that at the beginning of the titration, of course, in, in the burette, or pardon me, in the Erlenmeyer, you would have you know, a certain concentration of hydronium ion. In this case, uh, you can see the pH is close to one. So it gives you a sense of the approximate concentration. The idea is that Rather than use an indicator, we monitor the change in pH and we try to find that point that's halfway along the, the drastic change in pH. So the drastic change in pH is, is shown by 
you know, that very steep curve. It's a little idealized. I know in the lab it's a little hard to achieve that. But halfway between this line that I'm filling in dark and this line that I'm filling in dark would be essentially right here. So this would be the pH at equivalence point. And the 25, and we'll maybe estimate to one significant figure, mills that corresponds to that pH is the volume at the equivalence point. Of course, a point requires two locants. So you've got both the pH and you've got the volume. What would we expect the pH to be at 25 degrees Celsius for this titration at the equivalence point? Yes, exactly. Solid mouthed seven, right? In case people didn't see that, right? And, and why is it seven? Well, the only thing that you have present essentially is water and those negligible acids and negligible ba uh, bases, negligible bases. And you have just the ionization of water. So in this neutralization reaction, yes, the pH would be set. Is everyone okay on this idea? Yes? Okay. Next, one of the things that we want to do is just review, in a sense, some stoichiometry we did from last semester. And this corresponds also to some of the stuff that you need to do in the lab. In key questions number two, I say list on the pH graph the predominant species in the Erlenmeyer before the titration starts and at the equivalence point. So in a sense, this is what I've been doing here, that we've got the hydronium ion. And then just for completeness, we should say that really, we just have water. But how about we also add that the spectator ions are present because they're not doing anything. So, so they're still, they are still there. All right, so I, I add them for completeness, but of course they're not doing anything. So they are, they are predominant species because they're present, but they're not doing anything. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, yes, but let's, it's very good to point that out. Exactly, OH negative excess, yes. Because unlike a titration done with an indicator, we didn't stop. We didn't attempt to stop at the equivalence point. We just kept going. Now we use the whole graph data to help us decide where the equivalence point is. Yes, so there'd be an hydroxide excess further along. Right? In terms of next part, calculate the concentration of HCl. So what I'd like to point out is, and I'm going to once again write our balanced equation. This is just plain old stoichiometry. I was, I was um, hinting at this when we did the lab on Friday, but we didn't have a whole lot of time. And the idea is, well, what do you know about the hydroxide? Well, one, you know its concentration, which equals 0 0.100 molar. What else do we know about the hydroxide ions in, in terms of this, this whole reaction? Yeah, we know what volume was required to reach the equivalence point. And the volume right there, I'm going to estimate at 25 mils. What is it we know about the hydronium ion? Well, we hope, I hope you see that we know its volume. And its volume, and it, maybe I'll just be consistent here, I'm going to write this. And we don't know the concentration, but we do know its volume and that would be 20 mils. So you may remember in stoichiometry problems, moles of hydroxide ion, moles of hydroxide ion, I was just reflecting, all this is being recorded, all my mistakes are being recorded. Moles of hydroxide ion, the world is gonna know I make mistakes. Moles of hydronium ion. And then finally, of course, the concentration. So if you haven't done so, please go ahead and do that quick calculation. So in the previous slide, I showed the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion. 
but then to address the idea of the HCl, which is equivalent to the hydronium ion concentration, we'd have this 0.1 NUH times the volume in liters. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. And then finally divide by the volume. So the concentration should be 0.125 molar. If you did the whole calculation just using hydronium ion, hydroxide, hydronium hydroxide, then that, of course, would be equally correct. So this is one of the calculations essentially you also need to do for the lab.